Morning, this is the news and update for the week commencing the 4th of July. Now some of you may have noticed things are looking a bit different. It's true, I have had my hair cut this week and Oh, well, actually, <laughs> you've also had a hair... Well, yours is less of a haircut, more of a midlife crisis. Thanks. Uh, yeah, credit to Tilly, who had uh, recently had a short hairdo that inspired me to chop mine off. So, you know you've reached that certain age when you, your fashion is being defined by your 12-year-old <laughs> daughter. That's true. So, um, today it's the last week, last week we're looking at the Book of Ephesians and the spiritual practice of digging for gems. Next week we're starting a new thing and the spiritual practice we're going to do is Bible memorization, which could sound really boring if you were made to do it in Sunday school when you were a kid, but actually I think it's a really interesting way to uh, kind of get hold of a Bible verse and understand its truth. So I'm quite excited about doing that. So we're going to do that for about five or six weeks, not quite sure, uh, from next week. And nothing much to else to say really other than do you remember to pray for um, the following ministries, for cross lines, for roundabout, for refugee house and for home for good. Um, yeah. And so of course more than praying there's a chance to get involved if you'd like to know how to get involved. All of those need people to uh, you know help make them happen and in case you missed it last week Sarah interviewed Sue about roundabout and some with some of their kind of like work they're doing specific ways to help and so if you look at last week's about 20 seconds no 40 seconds into the news and update Sue is talking Sue talks to Sarah and gives some specific ways to get involved so we'd love people to get and help that yeah so let's pray together loving God you are making us into your bride and your body help us live in your love and work for your glory we pray all the things we do would bring fruit for your kingdom amen Good morning everyone, uh, my name is Alan and I'm part of Exeter Vineyard Church. Uh, my wife and I have been members here for 20 plus years now uh, and now I'm part of the leadership team here within the church. If you've been sort of listening along to our online services over the past few weeks, months even, you know that we've been doing a study looking at the book of Ephesians. Call it a book. It's not actually a book. It's actually part of the Bible. It's a letter. It's a letter that was written by uh, a man called Paul, one of uh, Jesus's early followers, who went around sharing the good news about Jesus and planting and setting up a lot of the early churches uh, at that time. He would travel around extensively into Asia Minor and Europe and would often be in a place for six, eight weeks or so and then move on to another place and then move on to another place. Sometimes he'd stay there for two, three years, but often he found it really difficult to go back and to retrace his steps to, to see the churches he'd set up and see how they're getting on. And so what he would do is he would often hear snippets about how they were getting on. And so he'd write to them, uh, sometimes a letter to encourage them or to share some extra truth, uh, which he felt was important for them at that time. Sometimes to, to say, actually, I think you're going off track and you need to come back into the right direction with Jesus. And so he would write these letters. And one of the letters which he wrote was to a church where he'd uh, been based for about three years in a big city called Ephesus in Asia Minor. Uh, he'd been there, he'd set the church up and he'd left it behind and he hadn't returned back. And he was very keen to, to write and encourage the church again and to share some truths with them. Uh, and so he wrote this letter. And that's what we've been looking at, this letter which Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. And we've been taking little chunks of it, little slices each week and seeing what God has to say to us. Now, Sometimes when you do this kind of thing, you, you can sort of get out various study guides and you can read what various experts have written online. But we very consciously wanted to try a different approach. Uh, and the approach we've called, we've gone with is, is something called digging for gems. Uh, that's not an official name. That's just something which we've coined. But the idea behind it is very simple. Uh, it's to, to prayerfully read through a passage two, three times and then to try and put that passage into our own words. Now, I'm going to be honest, I was a bit sceptical when I first heard that we were going to try this. But I've really found it effective. And I found it effective for two reasons. 
It's really helped me in one of two in two ways. The first one is for those parts of the Bible where sometimes Paul particularly writes these really, really heavy passages with lots and lots of religious spiritual words. And they're really tough going sometimes. It's, it's like he's on a mission to see how many religious words he can cram into to one sentence. And sometimes his sentence is like four, five, six lines long. And in the end, you kind of almost give up in despair and just think, well, I'll, I'll just try and get a general gist of what he's on about and I'll move on. But by slowing down and actually trying to unpack the passage and trying to actually work out, well, what's he saying through these words? You begin to get a much better understanding for the rich truths which there are. The other way where I found it really useful, it's through those passages which are, are really familiar to us. And there are some here which are really, really familiar, some of the most well-known passages in this part of the Bible. Now, sometimes when you get those passages, what happens is you just skate over the surface of them. You think, oh, I know this. That's fine. I don't need to spend any time on this. I know what this is all about. And yet you miss so much. And I'm going to be honest, that's where I am with this talk today. It is a really familiar passage, uh, one that I've known for, for several years. And I kind of just thought, oh, yeah, I know this. But actually, when I've slowed down and done this process, I've suddenly realised that actually, I don't think I, I, I really have got the main message of what's coming out of it. I think I've misunderstood it all the way through that time. And that's what I want to share with you today, is, that is by looking at this part in Ephesians chapter 6, is to spend some time looking at it and sharing with you what I've been learning through this process. So we're just going to have some people now uh, read the passage out to us, and then I'll talk to you a bit about what God's been saying to me. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, for it's on all of God's armour, so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, we are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armour, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan. That the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now still preaching the message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. To bring you up to date, Tychicus will give you a full report about what I'm doing and how I'm getting along. He's a beloved brother and faithful helper in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you the love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks to those who've helped this morning with the Bible readings. It's really appreciated. So before I get into talking about this particular passage, I just wanted to take a second and, uh, and explain a bit about my background, because it will help explain maybe why I've kind of misunderstood some of what, what we're going to be looking at in the past. Um, I was very fortunate. I grew up in a Christian home. My mum and dad were both Christians and, and in fact they were involved in full-time Christian work, travelling about, telling people about Jesus. And I became a Christian when I was very young. And so quite early on I started reading the Bible, I went along to kids' work and, and I got to know a lot and become familiar with a lot of stories in the Bible. And this was one of those passages which I got to know really, really well. And I got to know it in quite a simple way. Um, the way in which it was presented to me was very much as a Roman soldier coming along and, and having to strap on all of this armour uh, to protect himself against what was going to come at him. 
Um, I've got a kind of image here that you can have a look at. Hopefully it's now going to appear on the screen so you can see it. It's a really simple image and I, I can remember kind of colouring this in, writing on the names of the pieces of armour and everything. And I've done that same kind of thing with my own boys when they were growing up, helping them understand this part of the Bible. But there's a problem with it. I don't actually think that's necessarily what Paul meant when he wrote about this to the church in Ephesus. I think the first thing to remember is that when Paul wrote, he wasn't writing to an individual person. He was writing to the whole church. What typically would have happened is Paul would have written this letter from wherever he was staying at that particular point in time. He would have given it to one of his helpers who would have then carried it to that church, maybe 100 several hundred miles away, and then the whole church would have eagerly opened up that envelope and read what Paul had to say to them. And it would be a really, really big deal. The person who helped start their church first brought them to a knowledge of Jesus, sending them a message, giving them more information, giving them more help, uh, encouraging them, steering them in the right direction. And the whole church would have come together to read that message. And the same thing here, when they got this letter from Paul, the whole church would have been reading and hearing this message and receiving it as a whole. And I think this is particularly important for the church in Ephesus because this whole letter has been written to them and it's about unity, it's about togetherness, it's about the whole church, it's about the relationships and how they stay together. Now the particular point in time when Paul wrote this letter he was actually in prison in Rome. Uh, he wasn't kind of in, in a prison sort of locked away in a deep dark dungeon. He was a Roman citizen and therefore certain freedoms were given to him. He was probably on house arrest as we would call it now, uh, with maybe some Roman soldiers guarding him. And whilst he would have seen them as individual soldiers, in Paul's mind, no doubt, he would have seen them as being part of a wider legion or, or army or something like that and no doubt Paul would have been able to look out of his house and see those Roman armies coming into the city of Rome and going out as they went out to, co to conquer parts of their empire and for him he would have thought of them in this way of a whole army marching together and so when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he talks about them putting on the armour of God He's not saying to an individual person necessarily, oh, you've got to put your armour on and do it in a, in a kind of very defensive way. I'm absolutely sure what he was saying to the whole church is, you as a whole church need to put your armour on. You as a whole church need to, to get ready. And the reason he wanted them to get ready was because of their purpose as a church. We sometimes talk about, you know, what what's God has put us here for and we spent a lot of time as Exeter Vineyard seeking and praying God to understand what our purpose is and one of those main reasons is to, is to take a stand in this broken world. It's not the world as, we under, as God intended it to be. It's corrupt, it's broken, it's damaged. There's selfishness, there's poverty, there's illness, there's all kind of rottenness within the world. It's, it's not as God intended it. It's, it's what we typically call as being fallen. And when Paul was writing to this church in Ephesus, he was saying to them, I want you to put on your armour and I want you to take a stand as a church, a whole church, in one of the, the most um, broken cities in the world at that point in time, in Ephesus which some of the people who've done previous talks have, have already shared what it was like in that place. I want you as a church to take your stand as a whole and to stand for me, to be my voice, to be my arms, to be my legs, and to, to take the stand against the rottenness and the brokenness that's in that place there. And I think that's what God was asking us to do as a church, is to say, I want you to all collectively put on your armour and take your stand in Exeter, in the surrounding areas. Yes, you might have individual missions and responsibilities to do, but I want you as a collective, as a whole church to take your stand. It says in verse 12, I'll read it out, for our fight is not against any physical enemy. It's against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We're up against unseen power that controls this world. This is what God wants us to do as a church to take our stand against these forces and to be him in that environment. So the call today, I believe, is for each one of us to put on our armour, 
but then together to stand. And how are we to actually conduct that battle? Well, with the best will in the world, yes, strapping our armour on is, is important, but the kind of world which we're standing against is powerful. But God is more powerful. And I believe what God wants us to do is remember that, yes, we put our armour on. Yes, we take our stand. But he is the one who provides our, the power for us. He's the one who provides the strength and the might. And one of the things which really struck me as I was reading this passage is how we kind of skip over the very opening of it. We skip straight into putting on these bits of armour. And yet the very, very opening words, the first bit in all of this section about our purpose says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, if you unpack that a bit more, I guess the way you would put it is be strong in the Lord. Be empowered by being joined with him. Draw your strength from him. That strength, that boundless, mighty, infinite power. That's what we've got to draw upon. That's what we take our stand in. Yes, we put our armour on, but it's God's might and God's strength that we need to stand in. So how do we do that? Well, in a very practical way, we pray. And I think God is encouraging us to be a praying church, a church which takes this world to him and its challenges and its problems and its brokenness to him. And we present it to him and we ask him to empower us and to strengthen us and to bring his might into that situation. So, yes, we are the ones taking the stand, but he's the one who's bringing the power and the might to change that situation and, and enable us to, to do everything he wants us to. In our hub over the last few weeks, um, Mark and Sarah Denton, who, who are the hub leaders, uh, have encouraged us to be praying for one another. And it's just... just hit me that actually this is what we, God wants us to do. He wants us to pray for one another in whatever situation we're in, whatever setting we're in, and to commit to do that on a regular basis. To help, you know, pray that we, each one will stand in that particular situation, to stand in whatever setting we're in, and for God to come and bless and to work through us. And this morning, I think, the message is, as a church, to put on our armour, to take our stand, to seek God, and to see what he will do through us.